Uh, good morning. Uh, hopefully we can finish today. We've got about 20 slides to go through, so keep that in mind. I don't actually know what time it is. Oh, wow, we're good. We should be really good. So, um, I told you there was going to be a quiz, uh, but well, before we get to that, I got a... Have you ever heard of the, uh, the joke about the uh, evolutionary atheist who was walking through the woods? He was walking through the woods, he was looking at God's creation, but he denied his entire life. He taught evolution, he was admiring all the wonderful things. Suddenly, a bear exploded out of the bush, knocked him to the ground, and its hand raised to strike him, and he cried out, Oh my God, help me! And time stopped. And a voice from heaven thundered and said, You denied me all these years, taught denial, and now you want me to help you? And the atheist said, yeah, that would be kind of hypocritical. I can't really turn now. I mean, but maybe, maybe if you taught the bear your precepts and laws, he would, he would spare my life. And so the voice said, I'll try. And time snapped back, and the bear had a different look in his eyes, and he looked at his paw. He shook his head. He sat down on the man, put his paws together, and said, dear Lord, Thank you for this nutritious meal, which I'm about to partake. <clears throat> I don't think they got it up here yet, Brian. Oh, there we go. It's on this side. Sorry. Okay, so there's going to be a small quiz. Does anybody remember what evolutions call this picture? No? Family game night. So we started, we're going to review quickly, okay? Um, creationism, remember, is basically a supernatural, bringing something into existence. It, it's basically a mechanism of supernatural design. It is antithetical. It does not agree with Darwinian evolution. What is evolution? It's basically workout or complexities over time. The new version of Merriam-Webster basically says that it's completely derived through natural evolutionary process. The theory that we're familiar with was popularized by Charles Darwin in his book, Origin of Species. Okay? And its mechanism is completely natural. We, we talked about classical, which we're going we're gonna to take a look at again today. But classical Darwinist evolution is completely small changes over time, leading to the complexities we see, and then we found out that there's a problem with that. So we went to neo-Darwinism, which is basically we have to have these giant stair treads or stair, te stair steps going up where we have mu genetic mutations. And in the last 20 years, we'll find that that is just not possible. Uh, Darwin Darwinian evolution is antithetical to creationism. And then what is science? Anybody remember what, what, what we talked about here? Science is a process. We talked about the, the buzz phrase, the science. There is no the science. Science has continually been changing since its inception. All right? The science will continue to change. That's why we don't have the science. We just have science. So that is a made-up term. For the, and the purpose of it is to basically provide leverage for someone most often in a political argument that you don't agree with. All right? And we looked at the, the spectrum, of, we contrasted the spectrum of explanations, right? We've got over here uh, the parenthetical uh, of a two-foot string, two cups of something multiplied by a fa flashlight, divided by the square root of a cat, divided by your age squared and times mass. The equivalency of a chicken equals earth. That's kind of where we get with, what we get with evolution, as opposed to the, to the simplistic explanation of creation which is God made it, right? And we've got Gary Larson doing the far side, rolling a snake, and God says, boy, these things are a cinch. <clears throat> and we, we contrasted all of the different, the spectrum of theories from neo-Darwinist evolution on one, on, on one end to a young earth creationist on another. And then we read the biblical account in its entirety from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, 7. 
It says, this is the history of the beginning of the earth. We're not going to read it again because we're going to talk a little bit as we go through. Uh, but we're a reminder that the, the Bible is a library of 66 books. It begins, the very first part is about a creation of a heaven and an earth. And the very end of it is the creation of of a new heaven and new earth. If we have time, maybe we'll discuss a little bit of Revelation 21 at the end. So, we discussed that all three, the Trinity created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is a plural. We saw that in John, Jesus was there at the beginning. He was the spoken word. Okay? He was the logos, the logic. The spirit was hovering. The spirit put it into existence. And we have to set our foundation on the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we don't settle that fact, the entire rest of the Bible is basically illegitimate. And there's a war raging for the supremacy of your mind on that fact. Like I said, we have battles over facts. There's some problems in the the geologic columns. There's some issues with genetics. But you have to set your mind that that the first sentence is absolute truth. Regardless of some of the difference in mechanisms, okay? In other words, millions of years. Did God use millions of years? We'll discuss that a little bit. But it's, it's still a fact that God created the heavens and the earth. And why is that a problem for evolutionists? Because if we look at Psalm 2, a man wants to distance himself from an almighty God. He doesn't have so much problem, even, I think, even with creation. It's not that it's a myth. I, it's really that we don't want the accountability to a God who has laws and precepts and asks, tells us that we have to govern our bodies, our minds, and we have to submit ourselves to him. Man does not want that. He's inherently evil. And we read that in Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 says that God laughs at that. And this is kind of where we left off. So it's important to get that first sentence as the cornerstone of your mind. Remember we talked that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of your heart. Then Genesis 1-1 should be the cornerstone of your mind. And you have to have, as Brad said, if your house is built on a crooked foundation, it doesn't matter what you do with the framing the rest of the way. It's going, there is no shimming in life. Okay? It's going to be crooked, and it's going to cause problems down the road. We read in Isaiah 6, 9, and we read in Revelation, which is a deep passage. But we read that, that the false prophet will give, basically build an image, and the beast will cause that image to speak. There will be no scientific explanation when an inanimate object begins to speak. And if your mind is founded on the fallacy of evolution... Well, at that point, no, 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 I'll realize that there are super... No, no, no. You don't get the wisdom later on. We read about the parable of the ten virgins that that wisdom, your oil is filled up continually. You don't get it at, in your time of need. When your time of trial comes, when your time of testing comes, there's no drugstore, there's no vending machine where you can punch in a button and get your needed righteousness where you can get your needed strength that comes from being in the quiet place from intimacy with christ reading and meditating on his word when your time of trial comes it had better be there or you will fall and those who base themselves on evolutionary theory who believe that attest to it when deception comes at its greatest they will easily be deceived that's kind of where we left off uh, so we didn't really get to discuss. So I'm going to take questions concerning creation. We're going to go through it in order. Uh, these may not be all the questions you might have, but basically we're just going to kind of go through the order of some of the questions you might have as we read through Genesis 1 through 2, 7. So let there be light. What was the light? Because we see in day four is when the sun was created. So how is there light in the beginning if the sun wasn't created until day four? There's a couple of theories. One is that God wrote this Genesis from a perspective of someone seeing it from earth and we read that there was a lot of uh, atmospheric disturbance a lot of water vapor and carbon dioxide and that the plants when brought forth would have reduced that and and from your visibility it would have been 
than visible. There would have been light, but it would have been basically a glowing orb. I think that's, you know, eisegetical. In other words, you're reading too much into it. You're putting something there that's not there. I'm more exegetical. It's what it says is that there was light. Well, how can that be? Well, we read in Revelation that in the second earth that there won't be a sun. God's glory and the glory of his son will fill the earth and there will be light. So it's, it's not far-fetched at all to believe that in the beginning he made light. Maybe that you know he created the processes of combustion producing photons of light and there was just a glowing orb. I don't know, but it says there was light. We don't really are given a, any more specifics than that. But there was light. Dry land, was it Pangea? It was. Uh, all of the scientific evidence, and creationists and evolutionists both pretty much agree on this, that the actual shape of the uh, continents fit together, and if you look at the tectonic plates, they fit together. All right, And they're slowly moving apart, which we'll talk about later, supports a global flood and a breaking forth from the deep. But it was uh, one land mass at a time. So when God called the land forth, it was most likely one land mass. So what do the statements mean? Let the earth bring forth and according to its kind mean. Last week we talked about why I don't like sometimes the, the, the terminology theist, the, theistic evolution. Uh, I think evolution has a you know, stigmatizing title to it. But basically what we're talking about when, with this is macro versus micro evolution. Okay, if you want to be scientific. Macro evolution is Dar Darwin Darwinian evolution, where we have everything deriving from, from nothing. We have genetic mutations that result in complexities, and we don't see that. There's, very, there's no evidence for it. But micro evolution, which is basically what I call adaptability, we see everywhere. Okay, that is, if you want to call it microevolution, that's fine. I like the term adaptability because God made adaptability within creation. Uh, we'll see this later, but if you look around the room, look at all the different shapes and looks, facial features, body characteristics. We're, we're not adaptable. We are. Your body adapts to changing temperatures, which is why... Yesterday, when it was like 50 degrees outside, I hadn't had time to adapt because it was 110 the day before. But over time, you know, when, it, when, it, when boys and I go out in the fall and it starts getting cold, it's cold. But after a while, we're, we're still mowing in October and it's only 38 degrees and I'm breaking a sweat. Why? Your body adapted to those, those changes. Okay? So... Let the uh, earth bring forth according to its kind. So when we're talking about kinds, we look at the, the taxonomy of uh, living things. And we have the top, we have kingdom animalia. We have a phylum, which is chordata. We have a class, mammalia, which are mammals. Chordata is basically the, the main characteristics is vertebrate animals. We have an order, uh, carnivora. We have a family, ursidae, which is bear. And then finally we have the species, which is ursus Arctos. And when, when it says kind, we're mostly talking about uh, the family. It doesn't apply universally, but when we say kind, we're generally referring to things that would be agreeable in breeding. One thing can breed, so we, we know that zebras, horses, okay, um, mules, those things are not the same species, but they are interchangeably in breeding. They produce sometimes things that cannot reproduce after that, like a donkey. But they are interchangeable. So God did not have to create every last genetic change on earth. He produced kinds. And then he specifically said, if we go back, it says, let the earth bring forth. It didn't say that he actually produced. He said, let the earth. It's also said with plants. Let the earth. That statement in and of itself implies that God gave an ability of creation to adapt to bring about changes on its own within the genetic code. Okay, for example, I referenced this a couple minutes ago. Each human being has about 20,000 to 40,000 different genes in your body. But the overall entirety number of human genomes is, is a little over 2 million. 
over 2 million of those genes had to have been in Adam and Eve's bodies. Okay? And those have played out in the human race. We see vast differences between peoples. And in some cases, peoples have adapted to different environments. Okay? You cannot take uh, you know, the, the higher altitude uh, Incans and, and put them in a, you know, a desert or a lowland. Their, their lungs literally adapted to that climate. But they were still human beings. They weren't a, you know, a genetically different race. So what about the stars? Uh, the discovery of light years and the distances in the universe has been a problem for creationists. And here's why. When we see, let's say, the Andromeda galaxy, you can sometimes barely see it with your naked eye. But it's a, a little over 2 million light years away. Now a light year is how far light can travel in one year. Light travels 168,000 miles per second. It can wrap around the Earth eight times okay, in one second. It's exceedingly fast. It's the fastest thing we've ever discovered. There's probably nothing faster other than maybe God himself. Okay? But it can go basically 6 trillion miles in one year. All right? And this is 2 million light years away. How can we see something that's 2 million light years if the earth is only 6,000 years old. That does pose a problem. And so there are some theories uh, that light is slowing down. Even though the universe is expanding, the light itself is slowing down and it's, it was once much faster. There are some problems with that theory. The, the theory that creationists have come up with is that God created a mature universe um, it is actually continuing to expand. We'll talk about Edwin Hubble and Albert Einstein here in a second. Um, but that God drew out the stars with their light still hitting earth. If you take the point that it would have to be created the stars and then they have to reach earth, even the sun and the stars which the Bible says were given to Adam for si signs okay, and for light on the earth would not have got there on day four. So we clearly see that at least for the sun, there were things that were already matured. Adam and Eve were not created as babies, they were created as mature. We read that the plants, Adam didn't have to wait three years to get peaches off his trees. He got them immediately. So the plants were matured and there is, that's most likely what happened is that God created a mature universe and stretched out the light. Um, you know, there's... We've, we've seen a lot of stuff in stars, which we're going to talk about next. But we have, you know, binary stars that are two stars with one orbiting the other. And we can see the, the stars eclipse one another. And how could we see that if that's millions of light years away? Well, because that star was eclipsing as God drew out. It was already a mature system. Uh, life cycle of, of stars. This is one, you know, I have to teach stars in my classroom. Um... And I do not teach my students that we have seen stars born, because we never have. We have witnessed stars die. We, have, we can see stars that we are, assume are middle-aged based on their uh, amount of hydrogen and helium. And we can rudimentary calculate uh, how much is left. But we've never actually watched or have, have observed a star being born. There are smaller stars in nebulas, and that's where they say the proton stars are formed. But you would think, since we've seen multiple stars die, dozens of stars die, we would have witnessed in the last 100 years at least one star being born, and that's never occurred. It's not observable. It violates the scientific method to say that you can clearly understand there's a full life cycle that be, that, and that they're born naturally. Stars are born naturally when you've never observed that, even though there's evidence that they do have a life cycle. So that's a problem for evolutionists. And then blue stars. Uh, blue stars we are a problem for evolutionists. Blue stars are the hottest stars. They burn very quickly. The longest, um, I can't remember the name, it might be Canis Majoris, but it's, it's a massive blue star. The longest it would actually burn would be about 100,000 years based on the level of hydrogen and helium. So if it's only got 100,000 years left, okay, and that's 
all the blue stars, how could they have lasted 4.5 billion years? And they're all getting ready to end. That just doesn't equate. Okay. Edwin Hubble figured out that the universe is expanding and, so, and, and moving rapidly apart. And the evolutionist says, aha, the Big Bang, everything's blowing out. Albert Einstein actually attested that until he basically brought forth his theory of general relativity and found out that space, time, and gravity are linked. It's actually a fabric. He figured out that light actually bends with around planets. I'm not going to go into it, but the bottom line is this. Albert Einstein figured that everything, when you collapse everything down, it comes to nothing. Not stuff rolling around and suddenly colliding and then exploding, the math works out, it actually collapses into zero, nothing. And when he figured that out, then they had a problem again. Oh, that doesn't actually work. What does that support? God bringing forth something from nothing. So was it six literal days or 4.5 billion years? So we've got a problem there with the geologic layers, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth, hopefully as we go, but right off the bat, there are problems for um, evolutionists, and there are problems for creationists. So if you believe that, okay, God created everything, but he took 4.5 billion years to do it, right? It took him a long time. There are some issues, because the fossil record is not a record of life. It's a record of death. It's a record of dead things. That does not equate with creation that God created everything but there's dead things that were buried almost like he had to continue to start over every layer was like a trial run like nah I'm gonna bury all these we'll start over again and the fossil record doesn't support that anyway the fossil record massively supports a globalized flood which we'll talk about but that's a problem for those who don't want to believe in the six literal days and I, I can tell you that you know I struggle with it I am a young earth creationist because I just accept that God's word is there. There are some problems with the fossil record, but this is a problem if you believe the word of God, that that is not possible. And why is that? Because we have the genealogies that we can trace back to Adam that give us the time date of 6,000 years. Well, if the earth is this old, then that means that creation was before, way before Adam, and that, is, that does not work out. And there was death before Adam and we know that biblically that's not true. Death came after the fall. So too little time. If you have your Bible, open it, open it up to Isaiah 40. So for those who, God just can't, there's too much complexity. God couldn't have done this in six literal days. If we go to verse 12, it says this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? He weighs the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So that's twofold. The Bible says that God holds the universe between his pinky and his thumb. But he's not able to create it in six days. I think he is. Second Peter 3.8, for those of you who want to give some extra time, says that a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as a day to God. So there are a little bit of leniency. I don't think we're locked into six literal days, although I do attest to it. There is some time, but there's certainly not 4.5 billion years. And the fossil record is not a record of life, it's a record of death. Are there, is there any other support for a literal day? And there is. If you go to Exodus 20, 11, Give me just a second to find it. Okay. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. 
Go to 3117 while we're already in the book. And this says, it is, <clears throat> it is as a sign between me and the children of, the Lord, of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Hebrew there is the same as in Genesis. That a day was a literal day. Obviously there he's speaking about literal days. And it's the same phraseology and the same word in Genesis of a literal day. And it says in Exodus that it was given as a sign okay, to the people of, of Israel. That would lend, if we're believing the word of God, that would tell us that it is a literal day. Another issue, thorns before Adam. We know just like death came before Adam, we have thorns in the fossil record. This is a Devonian era fossilized thorn dated to 400 million BC. Well, that can't happen if we believe the biblical account because we know that thorns and thistles came after the fall. They were part of the curse and that was after Adam. How can you have fossilized thorns if they were older than Adam? You cannot. Sola Scriptura means that we believe Scripture alone. Hermeneutics, which the three rules of, or several rules of hermeneutics, you take the context, you take who was writing it, you take who was the audience who it was written to of Scripture, and then you take the whole of Scripture at large to determine passages in Scripture that are hard to understand. And when we do all that, when you take the whole of the Bible, the way that this was written, Genesis 1 through 2 7, it is written as six literal days. I told you, I think I told you last week, my favorite Bible teacher does not attest to a six literal day. He says there's too many problems in the fossil record, and we'll discuss some of those, although there have been new discoveries since he taught. Again, those are battles, that's not the war. The war is for the supremacy of your mind, believing the word of God. But there are some major issues, just, just, I, the, from what I'm seeing even though there are other problems, that alone tells you it's almost like game over. You cannot say that it was millions of years because we see problems based on the fossil record. So final thoughts on creation. Took three days to prepare it, three days to fill the earth. The days and the years and the months are all natural inter intervals of time given to us by creation. But the week is a theological span of time, the seven-day week. That is not something that we have in nature. Nothing in nature works on a week. Only we do. That's special to us. And who gave us that? God did. God did. I also do want to say one thing about the days. There are other portions of Scripture that, that use a day as a period of time. Actually, in Genesis, I think at the end, it says, in the day that the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Well, it says previously that it's six. So there are some issues, right? There are a day, other, other places in Scripture are a long period of time, okay? So God made certain things, and he created certain things. Three specific things that were created was matter. So created means something from nothing, Something from nothing. Whereas things made is like, like I make my house. I build it out of two by fours and block. But I didn't make it out of nothing. Where created means that you made it exist. Or where it wasn't there before. So God created matter. He created life. The breath of life and man. Now it's true that he formed man out of the dust of the earth. But man is different. Man has a spirit. We have a consciousness that was not there before. So man was created. And man was also in the image of God. Nothing else was made in the image of God. Only man. We were his, his, his pinnacle. His best. So all the evidence of life points to intelligence and design. When you look at nature... If you were just looking at this objectively... Like someone just studying all this stuff for the first time... You would not look at this... And say, I, that just happened, right? It was just luck of the draw. You look at the complexity of your hand. The tendons, the bone structure. That, that's luck. This is luck. My eye. I briefly looked at the eye. The eye is almost unimaginably complex. 
the way it works. That happened by chance. That's, you would not come to that conclusion on your own just using science as a process. We'll talk about why we've come to that conclusion for evolutionists. But irreducible complexity, okay? Irreducible complexity means that when we look at certain things scientifically, you cannot break them down, okay, to where something happened, a, a piece happened here, and then this piece happened here, and then that piece happened there through evolutionary process. Another evolutionary process means that a need, okay, necessitated the mutation. And when you look at like certain things, which would be a, a motorized flagella, okay, it has a gearing system. This gear spins this way, this gear spins this way, much like motors we have. There is no genetic need for this gear. It cannot be created first Last 70 million years, and then, oop, this gear came upon. It doesn't work like that. And the chance of the two gears coming together in the same, is just impossible. Irreduce, irreducible complexity means that there, things are so complex, you cannot reduce them down to part by part. That was the argument for creationists a long time before we get into the gen genetics that we'll cover here in a second. Okay? Now, why hasn't, this, is, this irreducible complexity was the first supporting standard for intelligent design. Intelligent design uh, today is kind of spearheaded by Stephen Meyer. He's a brilliant guy. He's with the Discovery Institute. I relied heavily on a lot of his work to teach. Uh, but there's, uh, uh, intelligent design is not really making headway for, in the scientific community at all. And it's not really making headway even with People who would attest to creation, and why is that? I have my thoughts, and I think it's because God wants Genesis 1-1 to be the theory. Uh, I think his name was John, I want to say John Roberts, I know that's the Supreme Court Justice, but one of the first proponents who, who came up with irreducible complexity, who's a, who's a creationist, but when he began to argue this, he made a statement and said, we have to get God out of the discussion. We have to get the Bible out of the discussion. We have to just basically purely put it in scientific form. And I understand why he did that. He didn't want to be accused of trying to shoehorn God in the back door. But I think God has said, no, no. This is true. Your science is sound, but your heart's not in the right place. You don't need to come up with a different line of, uh, of statements. I already wrote it down. It's right here. And you're not going to, it offends people's pride to take this as word. And I'm not going to allow this to flourish so that you can write the Bible or Genesis 1 2.0 on your own terms. And I, that's why I think intelligent design as a theory, which is completely valid, has not gained traction. And that uh, last, apples and peaches. So this is just my personal thoughts. These are just completely speculative. But every time, we didn't read the part where the fall happens, right? But every time you, you read that uh, and you see like an image of it, what's always the image that Eve has? An apple. And it's a red apple. And I think that's absolutely correct. It was a red delicious apple, which they got half right. Because it is red. It is not delicious. Okay? And here's my theory. I, I, peaches are my favorite. So... What was the tree of life? Everybody says it came from China. I'm like, no, it came from the Garden of Eden. Peaches, peach tree was the, the tree of life. All right, moving on to evolution, okay? So this is not a, this is not a modern theory. The theory of evolution was espoused or ideas relating to evolution was espoused long ago. Aristotle was one of the first, actually a lot of Greeks believe in ideas that you would call evolutionary or evolution type ideas. All right, it was popularized by Charles Darwin in 1859 when he wrote his book, The Origin of Species. He's actually vying for that position. There was a guy named George Wallace who basically had the exact same theory he was also taking trips. He, it's just that Charles Darwin got his published first. And that why, that's why his name is, you know, written in lights, so to speak. 
classical mechanism of, of Dar Darwin's evolution is natural selection, right? We see, um, you know, moths turning different colors. We see small changes in bird beaks, which we're, we're going to look at here in a second. But we found out that that just doesn't work. So the modern theory is neo-Darwinism or neo-evolution, which is basically genetic mutations provide the mechanism for monster, mutate, you know, monster changes in complexity of life. And that was a real, I mean, there wasn't really anything that they, an evolutionist saw that gave them that idea. What they did was basically said, okay, A plus B equals C. We know C is evolution. I've got a little bit of A. I don't have any of B. So I know what this equals. So here's B. That's what they said. And that's what they did with basically the mutations. Well, A doesn't work on its own. So I'm going to add B in. Well, do you see any evidence of that? No, but I know that, that C is true. Yeah, but you don't have any evidence. It doesn't matter. C is true. So I'm going to put B in. That doesn't work. Uh, that is not science. It, it violates science. Uh, Erasmus Darwin was Darwin's grandfather. He actually espoused a lot of these ideas when Darwin was young. He sowed the seeds of this theory to his grandson. So I'll take a moment here. Those of you who, you know, it's Father's Day today. Fathers, you have a profound impact on your children. But those of you who are grandparents can have a profound impact on your grandchildren. Darwin's father was not an evolutionist. He was very frustrated with his son and who he was becoming. His grandfather was. And Darwin went after his grandfather's theory when he became order. So the theory, uh, evolutionary theory, law versus theory, okay? Now, a lot of people, I actually thought this for a while. Well, evolution is not a law because it just can't be proved, right? They can't find everything. So that's, it's a theory because it's not a law. That's, it's partially true, but that's not fully true for those of you. And the real only reason I'm bringing it up is because I actually used that when I argued with some of my professors. And when you get corrected in, in class, it becomes very embarrassing. Uh, so, <laughs> and then you sit down and you know, go back to work. But the bottom line is, it's evolutionary theory is a theory because it can't be fully proven, all right? But it's not just because it's, it can't be fully proven. In, in order to be a law, something has to be mathematically expressed. Gravity is a mathematical expression. The laws of thermodynamics can be, they are provable, through observation, through scientific method and experimentation, but they're also mathematically expressed, okay? Uh, the laws of uh, motion, Newton's laws of motion, first, second, and third, those all can be mathematically expressed. So you have to first be completely provable, and then you have to have a mathematical expression. There's no mathematical expression for evolution, so we couldn't even take it down that road. So just to say, well, it's not a law because it's, it's a theory is not entirely true. Okay, many theories are really provable um, 100% and they're still not laws. But this is a theory that violates its own discipline's process of discovery, the scientific method. Okay, I teach the scientific method. We talked about this last week. You got a question, all right, you do observations and research, you develop an experiment, you analyze the data, you write a conclusion, and that has to be repeatable. For everyone who does science across the globe, it should be valid and reliable. Valid means that it's, it proves itself and reliable. It proves itself every single time. That's the scientific method. Now, I wouldn't have as much issue with this if they taught the theory of evolution as a theory that's not uh, basically reviewed via the scientific method. But they teach it as if the scientific method proves evolution. You, the scientific method can't even be used to prove evolution because we're not talking about observational science. We're talking about historical science, and you cannot prove historical science one way or the other using the scientific method. But that's how, it, that's how it's taught in schools. I know because I have teachers who teach it. They teach that the scientific method validates, supports, and proves evolutionary history. And it, it can't, and it doesn't. It violates its own discipline's process. You cannot observe it. Scientific method is only for observable science. But that's how it's taught. So, 
What is the theory in a nutshell? Basically, we have changes based on necessity, right? And this is Gary Larson again. I love him. We have, you see a fish are playing ball. They hit the ball over the water fence. What's going to happen? Well, obviously, we have a necessity. We have to get the ball. So obviously, we're going to develop some feet and lungs. And we're going to go grab the ball, right? They're all looking great moments in evolution. Okay. So problems with confronting evolution. Scientists, scientists cannot answer the question of the original origin of matter. So evolutionary theory still starts with matter being there. Right? We, we, they don't say that something came from nothing. They cannot answer that. Now there, here's a whole list of theories on how that happened. But obviously if there's that many, and this is just 11 of them. There's probably dozens upon dozens of different theories, and some guy got a grant from the government to go fund this, and he comes up with a name, and so that's what happens. But, uh, I mean, all of these are just wild theories. The first one, panspermiatic theory, it sounds interesting, doesn't it? Uh, it's basically that the earth, <laughs> the, uh, okay, so the earth, well, the universe is basically an alien farm, that alien... DNA, for lack of a better, has been sprinkled throughout the universe, and different systems have popped up. And this is a viable theory. Someone got paid to do that. It's crazy. I'm not going to read through all of them. RNA world theory, the theory of catastrophism, cosmoic interplanetary interplanetary theory, which is similar to the panspermiatic theory. But anyway, they don't agree. Science cannot come with come up with an answer. They cannot agree, and they have no viable answer for where thing where. So it was all a primordial soup or a dust cloud. Where did the dust come from? Where did the soup come from? Who was the chef? Don't know. No answer for that. So that's a major problem for evolutionists. Second problem. The fossil record, now they use the fossil record as their biggest pillar of evolution, but it actually poses a lot of problems for evolutionists. The first, we're not going to go through the whole problem, the whole sequence of problems, but the biggest one, most glaring one, is the Cambrian explosion. And actually, there, really every layer is a new explosion. The Cambrian is by far the biggest, where you have more than 40 complex animal groups. Again, not 40 animals, 40 animal families showing up, fully formed, fully functional, fully complex. The Cambrian layer shows up, boom, you've got all these animals. Where are the missing links? They're missing. Okay, so <laughs> they're, they're MIA, all right? Um, Darwin theorized, and actually Darwin was aware of this. He was asked about it, he was fully aware of it. At the time though, the geologic record was in its, you know, the discovery of the geologic record was in its infancy, and he basically proposed that over time, more discoveries will happen, and this will fill in the gaps. But what has happened since then? Missing links, mutations that lead to some new, have they found any? Zero. None. Yeah, but what about the fish that's got the lung that pumps itself up? <laughs> okay, and that, that's, a, sorry, that's a real thing. There's a fish who has a pump, and what they have found is, it's the same thing as an air bladder. It's just found a way to pump it up. It's not a lung. This fish has, no, it doesn't have a lung. It has an air bladder. All fish have air bladders. It's just found out a way to pump that up and roll over some dirt. Well, that proves evolution. Are you kidding me? You were formed because a fish can roll over some mud? No, that fish was created with that adaptability, and it uses it. There is no explanation for the rapid proliferation of all of these animals. There's just none. There isn't. They have no explanation for it. Well, how did this happen? I, we don't know. The layers were thought, and as we, as we go, we'll find out when we look at the geologic record, that the layers, okay, they've, they've decreased in time as we've went. We found out that through their, their dating methods, I say their being evolutionary dating methods, that the time continues to shrink, not expand. Okay. 
So natural selection is survival of the fittest. I'm not going to spend a long time. We can see that there's different beaks, and Darwin theorized, theorized well. We see these beak changes because one, you know, it's, it developed from eating a uh, plant, and then those plants go, you know, through wildfire or something don't happen, and that mutates into a beak that's meant to, you know, peck out wood and get, uh, you know, insects. Natural selection, that leads to the complexities of life. Okay, I mean, it was a well-argued theory, but it just doesn't happen. The, ma the vast expanses of time do not allow for survival of the fittest to happen, even at 4.5 billion years, even at 450 billion years. It's still not there. But microevolution is real. We can look at the bird's beaks, and we see that they do change. They can adapt. We see the moths. These are the one that we see in all the, the textbooks, or at least when I was a kid, right? Moths changing color. We have, the, we have white moths, okay, that match the trees in pre-industrial Europe. We have the Industrial Revolution. Soot covers the trees. They turn darker. The moths show up, okay, basically just sitting out in the open on these black trees. The birds pick them off. Ones that have a small change in color, darker, survive. Those breed, produce darker and darker moths. The moths now are hidden. That's a small variation in adaptability. And we can witness that. But God put that into creation. God designed that. God designed adaptability. That is a micro-evolutionary process, if you want, what I really call, like I said, adaptability. Okay? So, the classical Darwinian theory does not answer. So we have the neo-Darwinist evolutionary theory that cl claims that this was solved by genetic mutations, giant jumps. Okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's basically game over, and it's pretty simple to explain. Uh, genetic discoveries within the last 20 years have proven this mathematically impossible. It cannot ha happen. Mutations that we've seen, especially when things are young, which is when you would have to change an organism, are 100% lethal. Let me say that again. Genetic mutations, every single one that we have ever witnessed is lethal at young ages in organisms. And every single mutation, whether young or all, old, is always negative. So genetic mutations are two things. One, it's always a removal of DNA. It's not an addition or new material, new code. It's a removal of something that should be there. And that mutation, 100% of the time, always results in a negative. And if it happens young in the organism, it's lethal. It just doesn't work. But in the last 20 years, we've had basically a discovery of how amino acids are created. And I'm going to show you this picture. We might come back to this, this slide. Okay. We look at the cell, which we continually just find more and more complex. It's basically beyond our understanding, still to this day, to understand. But you've got a cell, you've got DNA, we've got a messenger RNA that takes the code into the ribosome. The ribosome transfers that material to amino acids, and that's what makes proteins, which what is what you see. We are made of proteins, okay? So you've got a protein. Now, a small protein would be 150 different amino acids. Are you with me so far? Think about it like a necklace. You got 150 beads in the necklace. There are 20 amino acids, okay, that you can choose from. There are 20 essential amino acids at life. Each bead, how you have 20 choices. First bead, 20 choices. Second bead, 20 choices. There's 150 beads, which is a really, really small protein. Here's what we have found is that in order for that to happen, the odds of you coming up with a beneficial protein, in other words, code that isn't gibberish, DNA that's not meaningless rambling numbers and letters, would be 1 to, the pow to 10 to the power, 80th power. Okay? That would require trillions upon trillions of years. So 10 to the 80th power is the likelihood, 1 over 10 to the 80th power is, is of your, uh, a gene basically, or a cell, randomly producing code that would be beneficial. Okay? Now, 
That's just a beneficial protein. It doesn't mean that it's actually going to produce something new. That just means that it has some sort of process. The odds of a beneficial mutation producing a new complexity, like lung tissue, are into Google plexes of time. What does that mean? So you're telling me there's a chance. I read you. I read you. What it means is that evolutionists are some of the most faith-filled people of our time. Creation is a faith. Fair enough. So is evolution. And mine's far more likely to be fact than yours is based on the science. It is. So what am I telling you? If you ever get into a debate with this, go back to the genetic code theory. It is done. Evolution is, is dead. It is not possible. Mathematically, it is impossible for it to happen. End of story. Checkmate. Game over. This does not happen. And that's only come about in the last 20 years. In the 1960s, we, we understood how this worked. But it wasn't until the last 20 years that we would understand what code would be beneficial and the odds of that. But in the last 20 years, we've realized that's just not possible. It's, it's impossible for that to happen. So evolution as a theory, scientifically, is dead. It's invalidated, period. Okay? Okay. So we're going to go over the fossil record. These, the fossil record supports creation more than it does evolution, but there are some problems. We're going to look we're going to look briefly at both of them. So, fossil record and evolution. The evidence supporting evolution from the fossil record is basically this that we see a, a taxonomy of complexity, okay? Where simple organisms are typically buried deeper and the more the farther you go up in a geological column, the more complex life gets. That's true. That tends to support a theory of millions of years and increasing complexity. But that's it. That is the only support. There's nothing in the fossil record other than that that actually supports. There's no missing links. What about Lucy? She was an ape. Okay. What about Australopithecus? Ape. Okay. What about the you know, Neanderthals? They were fully human. And we've actually found the same bone structures in Aborigines. The exact same bone structures in living people today. That's it. However, the fossil record per basically provides a lot of problems for evolutionists. So we'll, we've already talked about the Cambrian explosion. Sudden appearance. Things just suddenly blowing up with no, no trail of increasing complexity. Cross layer appearance. We have some animals that try to bite in lower levels, they disappear in other levels, and then they, they reappear. So for 70 million years, there were no trilobites, and then suddenly, they just pop back on the scene again. Does not make sense. There's no evidence of mutations. There's no missing links. There's not one evidentiary support of anything that started to mutate, change. All of the, I'll tell you this, if something appears, it appeared complex, and it has stayed complex. We'll, we'll take a look at some pictures. But basically, there's no sign of increasing complexity, mutating genetic changes. Once something appears, it stays the same through the entire rest of the record. There's no record of plate tectonics or erosion or weathering beneath the layers. So you're telling me the Cambrian layer lasted for 70 million years, 70 million years, and... You go up to the Devonian layer, and it's on a knife's edge. There's no weathering in those 70 million years. There's no deposition where there are localized floods where we see deposits and different things. There's none of that. 70 million years, and you have no sign of Earth's processes. There's also in the tectonic plates, we have subduction where one plate is traveling below. There's none of that in the layers. All of that is currently happening with the full fossil record being subducted underneath another tectonic plate. So plate tectonics happened after the fossil record was completely formed. If you believe in a global flood, it was. 
Metamorphic rock in locations where metamorphic rock should not have happened. All of the layers of the geologic column are sedimentary rock. The metamorphic rock, which has to have heat and pressures below that, yet we have metamorphic rock near the surface. How did that happen? Well, if the fountains of the deep broke forth, and we're, we're talking earthquakes, not seven or eight. We're talking earthquakes on a magnitude of, on a Richter scale of 50 to 100 on a Richter scale. A 7.0 earthquake, which demolishes entire regions. Multiply that by a factor of 10 and that's, that would explain why there's metamorphic rock sitting in places where it shouldn't. Radiometric dating, right? This is carbon-14 dating was, was, you know, it when I was a kid, right? All the fossils, carbon's not in rock, so they date fossils with carbon dating. They've actually found out that since then in the last, you know, 20 to 30 years, that carbon-14 is no good. Because basically the longest you could get a fossil to stretch mathematically would be less than a million years. Carbon-14 dating at the time when I was a kid was the science. You were a denier if you denied carbon-14 dating. It's gone. They don't even use it anymore. So they moved to radiometric dating. And there are three assumptions and problems. One that they, what, basically what they do is they basically look at the half-life. I'm talking about chemical composition. The half-life of atoms the half-life is how fast something decays. It spits out, um, you know, electrons. They turn into neutrons or neutrons turn into protons. It decays. And how long half of, you know, if you use uranium, in half of its life, you're going to end up with half the mass of uranium. And they look at that. But the problem is they don't know how much, uh, they don't basically know how much of the isotope was there in the original rock. Two, that there were no outside conditions that influenced the decay. And three, that that decay is the same over a period of time. Let me give you just one example. The whole earth floods, right? Trees. Think about when, when something floods. You ever seen a river loaded or a lake loaded with trees floating down? The whole earth floods. All of creation is going to be floating. Trillions of trees and plants. What happens when that begins to decay in those waters? pH goes down. And what happens to uranium when the pH lowers? It increases its speed of decay. But they don't take that into account. So radiometric dating is, is not... It, it's basically, they don't look at the, any evidence that would argue against it. They just look at the evidence for it, and that's what they run with. Entropy, which is basically that everything's in a state of decay. It, w things are not getting better. They're getting worse. Things are decaying. There's more and more problems. There's more and more genetic issues. Life as we know it is on a process of degradation, not increasing complexity. Okay? Are you guys all right with me going about 10 minutes over? I can, I can probably finish. I don't have, know if I have a full another... But we'll, we'll maybe go five to ten minutes over. I promise I'll, I'll end quickly. So here are some things that support the fossil record and evolution. Okay. Um, or excuse me. Uh, creation. The fossil record and creation. So there's a lot of supporting evidence. The sudden appearance. The cross layer appearance. The kinds all staying the same. Once they appear, they're all the same. Foss fossilization of thorns and rapid fossilization. No evidence of evolutionary complexity or missing links. Fossils are found in masses. Then there was just wide expanses of nothing. And then they're all found in masses. Why would that be? Because they're running from waters. Marine fossils are found at high evolutions. Well, yeah, but everything was an ocean. And what? No, not on Mount Everest they weren't. Yet we find marine animals thousands of feet above sea level. Sedimentary folds with no fracturing or deposition. Now, there was no, no record of weathering during those millions of years. The layers are traceable and transcontinental. We can find layers here in America that you can trace to Africa that doesn't come from a localized flood. A lot of these layers, they, scientists know that, rapid, that fossils were produced rapidly, but a lot of them say, well, it's localized over, you know, there was local. No, this layer is transferable across continents. 
That doesn't happen in a local flood. That happens in a global flood. There are some problems. The apparent why, why is the taxonomy of those organisms, the complexity, so precise? And it does. It's very, I, would, I don't want to say not complex, but just basically less complex organisms, and then you go to full complex near the top. One would argue that that's how, that's where things were buried at as they were trying to get away. Extinctions. Why do things suddenly disappear? Why are there no dinosaurs? If we believe the Bible, that we believe that there were uh, basically several dozen kinds of dinosaurs that Noah would have brought onto the ark, where did they go? Why were they chosen for extinction? We do not know. That poses a problem. And where are all the humans? There should have been millions of human remains. It's relatively few. I would explain that by saying God was going to destroy earth and man, and he destroyed the evidence of that as well. So here are some pictures of the fossil record. Rapid deposition. If some of the layers took millions of years to form, how did a fish not get to finish its meal? And this, I'm only showing you a few pictures. There are just scads of pictures, images, fossils that have issues, show rapid deposition and just disprove the evolutionary theory. We've got an aquatic, a, uh, aquatic dinosaur giving birth. I don't know if you can see my, you can't see that. But basically, that is a new dinosaur being birthed, and it's fossilized. That happened rapidly. The ginkgo leaf. It's from the very beginning. It's a plant that goes all the way back in the very beginning of the fossil record. It has stayed 4.5 billion years, and the ginkgo plant is the same today as it was back then, if you believe it's 4.5 billion years old. This is an interesting one. This is a human footprint next to a dinosaur footprint. Okay? Now, they've, they, what do they say? Ah, it's not real. You carved this out of the stone. So they cut it out of the rock and they gave it a CT scan and the impression is real. What you would find, it's fought, it is real. It, the, the rock dates, according to their records, old enough. And the CT scan proved that this was an actual footprint. This was not carved out of rock. So when this rock was made, this print was in there. And they say, I think it's somewhere around like 120 million years old. And it's a human footprint with a dinosaur footprint. Explain that one away. They can't. Same thing. This is the Permian period, 300, 250 million years old. Now this footprint is really faint. That's why they have to spray the rock to get it to, it looks better than what it does in real life. Okay, this is Dimetrodon. This is one of the prolific dinosaurs we find in this layer. And we have a human footprint. Again, verified by a CT scan. This was not cut out. So evolution just does not work. The fossil record doesn't support it. It has many challenges. It has challenges for creationists too. But it, the differences are, are vastly okay, outweighed. There's far more evidence in the fossil record against evolution than there is for. And there's far more evidence of a global flood causing the fossil record. Rapid deposition. All the layers on a knife edge. Animals trying to climb different heights. Organisms found thousands of miles above sea level that should not be there. Okay, It supports a global flood and the scriptures version of history. So we're just a few minutes over. I'm going to quickly discuss the lasting damage of evolution. Darwin was a privileged child. He basically thought that when he got older, he was going to inherit the money from his father. He wanted to basically be what you would call a, uh, you know, a Victorian gentleman. He wanted to be of no profession. Be able to do, just spend money that was accumulated by his parents. The seeds of, of sin were planted by his grandfather. Darwin was a real disappointment to his father who tried to put him into school. He failed in school. He tried to put him into the ministry. Darwin did complete 
uh, hit seminary, but he did not go into the ministry. I think that's because he knew his heart was not in it. He wasn't called to do that. And so he began to run. He just wanted to do something interesting. He joined the HMS Beagle, went to the Galapagos Islands, started making these observations, and came up with this theory. And his lifelong friend, Adam Sedgwick, who was a geologist, who was a professor at Cambridge, read his book. This was a very close family friend. It says this, I have read your book with more pain than pleasure. Parts I read with absolute sorrow because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. And it will brutalize humanity into a lower grade of degradation than ever recorded. Those were prophetic words. Evolution is a symptom of a man who was running. He was running from his father. I don't have time to go into the entire history. He was running from his father and he was running from an accountability to an almighty God. So what were the consequences? Some of the most dastardly individuals have used this theory for their own purposes. The concept, right, is perfection through violence, through struggle, struggle survival of the fittest. Darwin wrote in his book, from the war of nature, from famine and death, Think about that. From war of nature, not from God's perfect design, from war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. Violence brings about perfection. That's written in his book. And who quoted that in his autobiography? Mein Kampf, my struggle, Adolf Hitler. He, he, there's, Hitler used Darwin a lot. I don't have, I couldn't have time to put all the quotes in here, but he used it prolifically. He believed this 100% and said, you know what? We are the Aryan race. We're going to purge the human race of its imperfections. And since this was, I believe, the theory of evolution is demonically influenced. Who does Satan hate the most? God's people. And the worst atrocities in human history were perpetrated on the Jewish people based as this theory for its basis. Another one, Karl Marx wrote that Darwin's book was his basis for the communist ideology, right? So he has, a, it's an appropriate struggle. We have the proletariat, you and me, the commoners, and we have the bourgeoisie, the elites, those who are worth, based on violence and struggle, to be the elites. And we will subject, basically, you to whatever op oppressiveness we want because we are better than you. That is a communist ideology. And Stalin and Mussolini used it, again, widely. They, they quoted Darwin, as did Karl Marx. Racial slavery was found upon the same process. Now, as we know, you know, the Civil War, this was coming about right about the time when Darwin's book came. But it was used. And the thought process, which was not new, evolution as we know it today, was popularized. But that thought process is long history. Right? It was disgustingly used, presupposing intelligence based on race. And that theory has permeated almost every facet of life. And gained power over pretty much every almost all educational institutions and it's taught to almost everyone today C.S. Lewis wrote this this is a mouthful so if you don't get it at the first time don't be worried I had to read this 30 times and watch a video to figure out what he was saying <sighs> granted that reason capitalized reason is prior to matter and that the light of that primal reason illuminates finite minds I can understand how men should come by observation and inference to know a lot about the universe they live in. If, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology as a whole, that would be evolution, then I can not only not fit in Christianity, but I cannot even fit in science. If minds are wholly dependent upon brains, and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry on the meaningless flux of atoms, 
I cannot understand how the thoughts of those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. What does he mean? If I swallow evolution, it's meaningless. I'm from a primordial soup. And what I do in this life has no purpose, has no meaning, and has no consequences. I can slaughter 600 million people. They're just here by chance. I can see a pretty girl and take what I want. It's just another life form that happened to be here. I can show up with a weapon and murder down children. It's meaningless. In other words, life and meaning are empty and void and of no consequence. There is no consciousness. There is no morality. God didn't create this. It's all just happenstance. And therefore, it has no foundation of truth. And when you erode the foundation of truth, when the cornerstone of your heart is not on Christ, and the cornerstone of your mind is not on Genesis 1-1, then sin can run rampant in your life, and it runs rampant today in society. So I'll leave you with this. What's the truth? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen and amen. If you, want the, uh, if you want some good reading or the references, there's a list of them. I'd be always, I think it's printed out. You can always find them. I'll be willing to provide anything that you would want. I know I went way over time, and I appreciate you staying with me, but I wanted to try and finish since we didn't have, we only had about 10 minutes over, okay? Thank you.